Hello, hello everybody and welcome to the Alps podcast. We are very, very pleased uh, to be on day two of the Psychedelic Science Conference and I am honored and really we are very honored to have an amazing guest. But before I present the guest, I'm going to present the two hosts that I have with me. Marco, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Thanks a lot to you both, uh, Federico, the organizer, and Rick, uh, the conference speaker we just heard about. Yes, so we have a, a Rick uh, Dublin, which is here. Frankly, you are the founder of MAPS. You are, let's say, the, the founder of the psychedelic renaissance. So uh, my first question to you is, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I walk around in a state of utter amazement these days. Um, I never, ever would have predicted that there would be billions of dollars of investor money going into hundreds of for-profit psychedelic companies. Of course, I wish that it was billions of dollars of philanthropy going into nonprofit psychedelic companies, but still, it's kind of amazing the things that are happening and the way people who maybe decades ago were against what we're doing are now turning their minds around. And just to give you one example of that, why I'm sort of walking around in amazement, um, there was a woman, Rachel Neuer, who just wrote a book about MDMA called I Feel Love. And for this book, she wanted to interview some of the people that were from the DEA in the 80s who tried to criminalize MDMA. So I said I would try to find them, and I found this one man, Frank Sapienza, that I had gone to multiple of the hearings, and he was the representative of the DEA at the hearings. Well, it turns out that I found him on LinkedIn, and he's no longer at the DEA, but he consults for pharma companies when they want to reschedule drugs. And so I wrote him a message. I said, we haven't talked for 35 years, and when you were trying to criminalize ecstasy, you, didn't, you admitted that you didn't know that it was used as a therapy drug. So you weren't really trying to stop the therapy. We knew that, but that's what happened anyway. So I said, now we've made all this progress. Would you be willing to speak to this reporter? And also, would you be willing to join our team as a consultant to help us in our negotiations with FDA to, and DEA to reschedule MDMA? And the very next day, he wrote me back and said, yes, I remember, and I'd be glad to help you. And this was after not talking for 35 years. So there's a lot of that kind of long-term stuff that's turning around that's amazing. Do, can you say one thing which you thought made the difference between this criminalization and, and where we are now? Is there one thing or? Yes, there, there is one thing. Um, and it was in 1992, and um, it was the FDA. And the FDA had blocked research for decades with psychedelics. And psychedelic research had been blocked pretty much all over the world as well in the reaction to the psychedelic 60s. And so um, because of the AIDS community, so AIDS was terrible in the 80s. And there was a group called ACT UP, which mm -hmm. was really protesting the fact that the FDA was very slow to approve drugs. And they felt that they were overly worried about risks, but they weren't looking at a dire need that, you know, people had this fatal illness and that they weren't looking enough at benefits. And so ACT UP did a demonstration and they actually shut down the FDA building, which shocked the FDA. So they created a new group in response called the Pilot Drug Evaluation Staff to pilot test new ways to evaluate drugs that might be faster. This was created in 1990. And um, we had... Uh, applied to do MDMA research since I started MAPS in 86, and it was uh, we had all these protocols rejected. In 1990, they approved Rick Strassman to do a study with DMT, but it was looking in a negative way, sort of could more DMT in your brain cause schizophrenia or something, funded in part by the schizophrenia organizations. Um, and so in 1992, the FDA said they have to have a meeting, a formal meeting, should they open the door to therapy research with psychedelics, looking at the benefits, not just the risks. And that meeting went great, and the FDA did decide that they would open up research, and then they gave us permission for the first study with MDMA. So I think if we look back mm -hmm. on what is the key moment for the psychedelic renaissance now, it's the FDA in 1992 saying, we're done with prohibition of psychedelic research, regardless of the science, it's been the politics, to suppress this research, and we're not going to do that anymore. Very nice. So back to Geneva, Switzerland, when yeah. we are live from the APS conference 2023, could you remind us what was the importance of Switzerland in 1986 when you founded the MAPS Association? Yes. Well, let me go back just one year to 1985. So, um, you know, I, I had um, developed a, a, an interesting relationship with Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he had written this book called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And he talked about this importance of us understanding we're all in it together. He had a picture of the Earth from space. And... I wrote to him and I said, I, I, I totally agree with your theories, with your um, 
emphasis on global spirituality, but you don't say anything about psychedelics. Um, you know, would you be willing to learn about psychedelics and open up the door to psychedelic research? And he wrote me back, which shocked me, and recommended that I uh, contact uh, Vanya Palmers and, and others. So I, you know, met Vanya in, in 83. Um, then in 84, the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA. And then, um, you know, we were suing them and the court case was going well. And then I became clear that the um, DEA was trying to criminalize MDMA internationally through the WHO. And then they would say, oh, now we have to follow suit because of our treaty obligations. So um, Robert Mueller, the assistant secretary of the UN, set up an appointment for me here in Geneva. So in 85, I came here and met with the expert committee that was working on it and, and presented them information. And actually, they criminalized MDMA um, but they had a footnote, and the footnote was that um, the chairman, which was ironically Stan Groff's brother, Paul Groff, was mm. the chairman of this committee, and, and everybody voted to criminalize except for him. And the footnote said that they were worried that this criminalization would slow down research and that they should be encouraging the nations of the world to facilitate this important research. So nothing really came of that until around 1988. So in 86, you know, this again being the home of Albert Hoffman and the discovery of LSD and the synthesis of psilocybin. Um, but it was really 88 when uh, the Swiss psychiatrist got approval in part because of this footnote that they then got permission to start working with MDMA and LSD with their um, patients. This was SAP, the Swiss group. Um, and so that was exciting for us that somewhere in the world there was this opportunity that was legal and Peter Gasser eventually wrote a paper about this um, that sort of spread that word. And then we would um, start coming here for various meetings to be where actually psychedelic research was happening, even though it was suppressed in the United States. So Switzerland was um, really the pioneering place. And from a symbolic way of the psychedelic renaissance, there were two main things that I felt we had to do from a sort of social, global, political, symbolic me means to really have a psychedelic renaissance. The first was that we had to start research at Harvard again, because mm -hmm. that's where Timothy Leary was. Good thing. And the second one is we had to start LSD research, because that was the quintessential bad psychedelic. And so we were able, uh, with Peter Gasser, uh, in 2008, to start LSD research for the first time here in Switzerland. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that that happened several months before Albert Hoffman died, mm. so that he could see the he opening see of, of LSD research. And Anita, also his wife, saw that before she died, a few months before he died. Um, then the other was this, again, psychedelic research at Harvard. And so that was um, 2000 and about seven, 2006, seven, And that was also MDMA, but it was for cancer patients with anxiety. So Switzerland has been an inspiration for us. And also the training programs that they have here for therapists are uh, unparalleled because they involve being able to give people MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, LSD, um, the way in which compassionate use is available for psychiatrists and therapists to work with a range of patients with a range of different psychedelics. It's, uh, it's leading the world here in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. That's very good. And uh, everybody should go check out also the Alps uh, conference uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you just did. Huh? It's, yeah. it's going to be on YouTube. You were speaking at this conference about M M MDMA assisted therapy uh, for PTSD, and it's a phase three trial. Yeah. So yes. it's nearly going to be finished. Can you say a few words on that and where it's gone? Do you think it's going to be in uh, next year? Yeah. So we've finished phase three. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, basically, it took us from 1992 through the 90s to do the phase one. Then phase two was 2000 to 2016, um, where you figure out how to design phase three. Phase three was 2018, and we finished it in 2023. And we have two successful phase three studies, and we will be submitting data to the FDA the first, couple, first half of December. And then we're hopeful by around June or the mid-2024 that we will, if all goes well, have FDA approval. Wow. That's uh, yeah. that's great, and do, because you were also explaining during the conference that you also have views for the future after twenty twenty four for that. What, yeah. what are, are they? Well, the most important one after um, FDA is to come to Europe to really get approval from the European Medicines Agency and England from MHRA. Um, and, and does that need new studies, or it's going to be able? They're going to be able to to to. Uh, well, to that work on that. that is still to be determined. Okay. So the MHRA. Um, you know, England, I think, made a disastrous move, which was Brexit. You know, right around the time we made a disastrous move in America, which was to uh, elect President Trump in these isolationist uh, attitudes. And so uh, the MHRA 
you know, the, the European Medicines Agency used to be in London, now they're in Amsterdam. So the MHRA doesn't have enough resources to really fully review drugs the way they did before. And so they're thinking about just saying, if FDA approval happens, then that might be enough for MHRA. I'm not sure if the EMA would also want us to do additional studies. We have done some small studies in uh, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic, but these are just small number mm -hmm. of subjects. So we will see if we do have FDA approval, then what will be required of us from EMA. Yeah. I think last year, Federico, we had somebody from the, the, the Santé Suisse that was saying that normally they would rely on the phase three trial from the U.S. So hopefully oh, it's going to be. Yeah, it was the Federal Office of Public Health. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it's a systemic endeavor, so it will work yeah. out also for other countries. So w what would it actually mean here then in Switzerland? So now you've got a small, relatively small group of psychiatrists that can do this work. If it gets, if our, if FDA says yes, then how do you imagine it would be regulated here in Switzerland? It's very difficult to predict. Uh, in any yeah. case, um, I don't think I have the means to really yeah. imagine this. And um, yeah, in any case, uh, I guess uh, um, one idea would be uh, to regulate it as a form of psychotherapy, because in Switzerland we have really um, very good uh, regularization and formalization of psychotherapy training and schools. So in that sense, you would really have to create... Um, like um, educational uh, proposals for people like um, at the level of the postgraduate education. Okay, just to say that once we, um, if we do get FDA approval, we want the um, therapists that work to be only those that have been through our, a training program in the method that we've used mm -hmm. in phase three. We want them to understand that. But once we've determined that they understand that, then when they practice, they don't have to stick with that. Okay. They can add other techniques that they like if they want to do guided imagery or they want to add meditation or, or any kind of different thing to it. That will be up to the therapist. But we want them to have a minimum set of understandings of the work that went into the phase three and the successful mm -hmm. studies. And then... Um, then they can innovate or add. Yeah. And maybe we should copy the American model because you were also showing that you think you will be able to have by 2030, 25,000 therapists. Well, are, this is that, our aspirational that, goal, but I think, it's, goal. I think it's really very possible. But we, we have three parts of the training program. The first part is like a, um, six days in, in person, around 50 people going over videotapes of therapy sessions, our treatment approach, our, what are called adherence criteria, Second part, which is difficult, and hopefully we can do more here in Switzerland, which is therapists receiving their own experiences with mm -hmm. psychedelics in a therapeutic context. And then the third part of the training is where therapists work with their first patients, and it's all videotaped, and then we have the videotapes reviewed by our uh, what are called adherence raters, and then okay. supervisors speak back to the therapists about little tips. And then, again, once we know that they're... Um, no, understand the method we've used, then they're on their own. Yeah, mm -hmm. and with twenty-five thousand uh, therapists, how many do you think uh, you could? Um, well, um, uh, you could have how many uh, persons could you treat? Well, again, it's forty-two hours of therapy. Yeah, um, and we do use a two-person team. So we guess that a team could maybe do, um, and we have a three MDMA sessions and a lot of prep and integration sessions. So. We think a team could maybe do um, thirty thousand, you know, th uh, thirty people a year, or something okay. like that. Now, again, we're not talking about group therapy yet. That's going to be the big dynamic that may change everything. But you know, thirty people per year, and so you know, that's roughly maybe half a million people if we wow. get to that point per year. Um, and then we will see what happens with group therapy. Right. Maybe one question to both of you guys, Federico and Rick. Um, nowadays, what will be, after your opinion, the most promising regions of the world in terms of psychedelics for therapeutic use, except US and Switzerland? Well, there's a bunch of different ways to look at most promising. You know, I would say, sadly, um, pharma looks at most promising is where they make the most money. You know, the, the other way to say it is, where's the most uh, suffering? And, and mm -hmm. then how do we bring healing there? So I think that, um, you know, Australia is already moving forward in a bunch of different ways. I think the um, Brazilians, we've already had a bunch of research in Brazil. But again, from a point of view of really globalization, FDA approval is, is extraordinarily helpful, but so is EMA approval. So the most promising for us is to go from FDA approval to work with EMA. And then if you have FDA and EMA, almost all the countries of the world mm -hmm. will let you 
start immediately to treat patients. The exceptions are Japan, which is a major pharmaceutical market, but they say their island nature has got unique genetics, and therefore they want to see studies uh, in Japan. And the other two countries right now are China and Russia, where there are complete, uh, basically, prohibitions on working with psychedelics with patients right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but but most promising for us, I think, would be EMA. Yeah, I, I would like just, um, you know, like maybe it would depend on the openness of the academic system. So the academia, like universities, are the houses of the critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So the more you have uh, an openness to that uh, on that side in a country, the more you would have, um, yeah, professionals involving in this research and then bringing it to their own country. Well, yeah, although I would say that... Um, the reason that we have the psychedelic re renaissance, I'd say, is in part because the United States is one of the few countries where you can do research without connection to an institution and then the academic institution. So in, in Canada, um, you have to have approval by an academic institution. Um, in Israel, you have to have approval by academic institution. And in the United States, fortunately, it's there are independent IRBs that are for people who are not affiliated with institutions. And we were unable back in 1992 when there was such prejudice against psychedelics and everybody was oh, so worried MDMA neurotoxicity. Um, the only way we could start is in private practice sites with independent IRBs. So yes, I think if you get universities uh, working, but universities, I'd say, are often one step behind innovation. You know, they're, they're just groups in, mm -hmm. in general when you have a group consensus about something, you only need a few people to be uncomfortable, and then the group won't go for it. Mm. So we were trying to do work in institutions in the United States. They kicked us out. The, in fact, Michael Midhofer is one of the other speakers here. Was He didn't mention it here today, but he was um, a lecturer at the Medical University of South Carolina when we first started to work together. And when we got FDA permission, they told him that you're either going to have to leave the university or stop the study. And he said, I'm leaving the university. And he did the study. Now, a few years ago, um, the Medical University of South Carolina invited Michael back to give lectures and said they want to do a psychedelic research center there. Mm -hmm. And they said, you were right way back then. Mm -hmm. but, so, um, but I'm concerned about... Yeah. Uh, and what would be a good suggestion then to collaborate with the academic system today well, for well, psychedelic therapy? Well, I think now we've gotten over that controversy. So now I think, you know, Yale, Harvard, UC San Francisco, yeah. Stanford, all these universities are trying to set up their own psychedelic research centers. So th there's two kinds of research in a way. One is sort of mechanisms of action. How does this work? How does it work in the brain? I, I have been uh, unimpressed by how little we have learned from yeah. all of this research to make therapists more effective, to help patients. But there is maybe universities love doing mechanism of action stuff. A lot of government funding is only for mechanism of action, or we talked yesterday about mm -hmm. the uh, Welcome Trust. You know, they're only mm -hmm. funding mechanism of action. Um, but I think the other part is that there's so many different um, patient populations, so many different therapeutic approaches that have not been studied. Yeah. So I think we could interest academic uh, institutions in so many ways to expand the yeah, research. Yeah, that's endless, and they are already ready with fundings and skills to do the research and to practice their own um, areas of uh, interest, like for all mm. the psychopathologists, for example, all the kind of psychotherapies. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think, fortunately, um, we have got past the point where institutions wanted to have nothing to do with this. Yeah. Again, as an example of the Wellcome Trust, it was around 2006, 2007. They like, have about $40 billion. They're the biggest charity in England. And when we met with them, and they're focused on neuroscience. And um, when we first met with them, um, they said it was a reputational risk to have anything mm. to do with psychedelics. And I said, it's a reputational opportunity. You can, and I said, also, you're sitting on $40 billion. Who do you care about your reputation? What, you don't need donors. You, <laughs> you, know, you should be courageous. Do something. And they kicked us out the door and said it's a reputational risk. Mm. And so now and we, maybe they're going to come around. But, but I do think that... Um, maybe this is a, a question because uh, for all the people, the same like Alps and all, they're, they're searching yeah. for funding, but it's not yeah. so easy to get. Right. So what would be your advice? Because with MAPS, you've really found ways to, to obtain funding. What would be your advice to all those Alps which are uh, here in Europe or in uh, other countries? It's, uh, there's a culture of philanthropy that's really strong in America, in part because... We we don't have a lot of government services. So when you okay. look at what does college cost in Europe, it's way more affordable than college in America. And you've got national health insurance. And so people are more willing to pay taxes in Europe, but they're also less willing to give to philanthropy mm -hmm. because the governments have tended to do more of that work. In America, 
we know the government is abandoning all sorts of people. There's no national health insurance. There's loads of people uninsured. So um, we've been singularly unsuccessful in getting major donations from people from Europe, even for research in wow. Europe. The funding that we've got so far from um, um, is from tech innovators in the U.S. have helped fund our, our mm -hmm. work in Europe. We've recently sort of run out of funds for Europe for a while. So I think it's to find individuals. I mean, I've been... Our approach has been to find individuals who are very wealthy, who make their own decisions. When you try to go to foundations or groups, they tend to be more conservative. So um, if there are wealthy individuals that you can identify in some way or another that are sympathetic with psychedelics, that was the most effective approach for us. Was okay. in, We still have not gotten any grants, actually, as far as I'm aware, from... Um, other than our uh, grants from states for marijuana research, but we've not gotten any grants from psychedelics from people, from organizations that either we don't know the founders or the people who gave the grants haven't done loads of psychedelics. Mm. Okay. <laughs> but know, I think uh, really then in Switzerland, the situation is really different because we have yeah. already so many universities doing uh, academic research yeah. on this. Yeah. So you uh, can collaborate with them to yeah. ask for proper funding from the um, you know Swiss uh, national funding um, yeah option and um, also then through all the non-profit foundations uh, fr philanthropic foundations yeah. that are here yeah, so yeah it's easy. and I think that there may also be um, sort of more um, pan-european funding for mental health and different programs like that mm -hmm. so I think um, again but again trying to do drug development research yeah. is, is harder to get funds yeah, yeah. for Mm -hmm. Of course. I think it's a good topic, and thanks for the tip, because uh, I know everybody uh, struggles <laughs> on that, and yeah. uh, you seem to have found a good way. Yeah. So I think... Uh, that, so one last question. Uh, well, uh, you know, I call, call you the, the godfather of uh, psychedelic research, of the, or psychedelic renaissance, as I would say. <laughs> right. And what, what, would your, what do you want your legacy to be? Ah, uh, what do I want? Well, I hope that we get FDA approval, <laughs> yes. of, of course. Um, but then... I really hope that we move around to globalize and particularly the humanitarian projects in countries that have, you know, large amounts of trauma, but hardly any money. I think that would be the way to um, fully um, leave a, an important legacy is that we need to really think globally about the burden of trauma and we need to figure out different culturally competent ways in uh, places where there have local healers, where they don't have psychiatrists and therapists. So um, I think my... Um, you know, it's hard to start thinking of your legacy, you know, because it means, of course, you're dead. <laughs> What's your legacy? But uh, but it is inevitable. And so, um, yeah, it was something that once we got it, I guess it would be that once we um, achieved our goals in the U.S. that we really globalized. The, spir the spiritual society. Yeah, the spiritualized humanity. I mean, I, I mean, that would be the legacy of all of us, though. That, that would just be... Um, where I think we're going to go. And if we don't go there, we might just destroy the place. Yeah. And we are doing a pretty good job of that already. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, humanity is at a crossroads. And, um, you know, in my TED Talk, I ended up by saying that there's a race between uh, consciousness and catastrophe. <laughs> Two and, C's. <laughs> yes, and I'm hoping that, you know, psychedelics can help consciousness uh, prevail. But that is the struggle that we're engaged in. And so I think the legacy would be that... Um, I helped uh, tip the balance a little bit towards psychedelics and consciousness. Well, I think you've already done that, <laughs> and you're still alive, and we're very happy about <laughs> right, it. So, thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank you a lot. Thank you a lot for all that you've done and all that you're doing. Thank you all also for coming to Alps and uh, supporting us locally in Switzerland and Europe. I think uh, you're an example to all of us, and uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. thank you very much. And, and Federico, I'm really looking forward to what we can do to uh, expand the training of therapists yeah, yeah, and see. bring therapists from around the world potentially to Switzerland yeah. one day if there's ever ways to uh, change the rules yeah. about how you can only do work inside uh, yeah. with citizens inside Switzerland. We will, we will keep on the discussion also on this uh, um, basically overlapping that you just did on consciousness and spir spirituality. Yeah. This really interests me because, um, yeah, there's a mess there out there on these definitions how do we really understand these words yeah. so yeah for uh, for another time yeah yeah we have time exactly. <laughs> well <laughs> from what i hear you're going to do this next year yeah maybe maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, there's a lot of topics to talk. Thank you very much <laughs> to everybody you, for taking the time. And of course, we will put all the links in the oh, show notes. Yes. Yeah. I just want to add that, um, you know, at our psychedelic science conference yes. uh, in June, we had 12,400 people wow. and we had about um, over 300 talks. And so we're just now posting them all on our website right. and they're all for free. People were asking them to make a donation if they want to, but if they don't, it's all for free. So if people go to uh, maps.org or psychedelicscience.org, there's enormous richness of content wow. from the psychedelic science conference and that's great and we will do also the same on the alps conference to put everything uh, in uh, on our the youtube channel so people can access it of course we will put all the links in the show notes again rick everybody thank you very much for participating we are honored